Earlier, I showed you pictures of those cloud chambers, those bubble chambers, where you can see the paths of particles, subatomic particles. But if we wanted to start really probing how these particles acted and try to study them better, we sort of went the route of taking some things we already could have and accelerating those things, basically throwing them really, really, really fast at other things and seeing what happened. So in order to do that, you need to be able to accelerate particles. So we end up building these things called particle accelerators, and there's a number of different kinds of accelerators. The diagram up on the right is a linear particle accelerator, and it works basically just by switching positive and negative charge of these tubes in the accelerator. So you start out with the source of whatever your particles are. It says ion, but whatever the particle is that you're trying to accelerate, Right, you start out there on the left, and whatever its charge is, you have it set up so that the first little two is the opposite charge of that. Right? So if your particle is negatively charged, then right to begin with, you want that tube to be positively charged, and it will attract that particle. So it will accelerate as it goes towards that tube, and then once it goes through, you switch the voltage. You switch the sign of the charge here. That's where we have this radial frequency oscillator, meaning that we're switching the sign of these charged tubes continuously. So the particle went through your first tube, but now you switch the sign, and so the next tube is now also uh, attracting it, and so it gets attracted to that next tube, and it gets accelerated again. Right? So in each of these gaps in between the tubes, you have it set up so that your particle is getting attracted to the next tube, and also getting repulsed by the last one, actually. So then in each of these empty spaces in between the tubes, your particle keeps getting these kicks. Right? Accelerating, 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 accelerating. The tubes end up needing to be longer and longer and longer because the particles went faster and faster and faster. But in that way, you can just sort of continually boost the particle along this linear path until you accelerate it as much as you can or as much as you care to. The picture down here actually goes back to the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, and it's not technically a linear accelerator. It's actually a very large circle. This tube is part of a very large circle. But it's such a large circle that it looks fairly straight if you just look at one section of it. You can see it kind of bent a little bit towards you, very far reaches in that picture. Like I said, the point of accelerating these particles is to get them up to very, very high energies so that you can basically just smash them into other things. It seems pretty crude, but I mean, it is a little bit, but the technologies that are used in order to look at the pieces that fly out are incredibly complicated and advanced. One way to think about this is like if you have a rock and you want to know what the rock is made of or what's inside the rock, one thing you can do is just try to throw it at the ground. Right? Try to throw it at something as hard as you can, maybe throw it at another rock, and see if you can break it apart and look at what the pieces are made of. So that's sort of like what happens in these particle accelerators and particle colliders, except that the pieces that your rock breaks into can actually reform and become other sort of pieces. So that's one difference in the very small world. Another thing too, actually, is that if you were to throw this rock hard enough, it could smash and in that process create actually new rocks, create entirely new things. Something else strange that happens in the world of particles. So another way of accelerating particles is to use what's known as a cyclotron. And the basic setup of the cyclotron looks like this where you have these two sort of uh, disks, sort of open hollow disks, and you're able to create your particles, or you get your particles somehow to start out in the middle of those disks, right in the middle where the dotted line starts. And they're shooting out towards this disk, and then in these disks you have magnetic fields that are pointing in this picture down through these disks. So if they're charged particles and they start to fly into this magnetic field, they're going to feel the Lorentz force, right? Velocity is going that way, the magnetic field is going that way, so the force is going to come around this way. You're going to end up curving the path of that particle. So it curves around and it comes back through this gap. And the key thing here is that in the gap you have an electric field set up, just like the electric field in between the tubes and the linear accelerator. This electric field is going to accelerate that particle. So your particle goes through, gets curved by the magnetic field, gets this boost in the gap by the electric field, curve back around by the other magnetic field, and you end up switching the polarity so that the electric field switches to the opposite direction when it comes back through, so you boost it again. 
And so again, as, as it's going through, every time it passes this gap, the electric field is set up in such a way where you're kind of giving more kicks to these particles and speeding up, speeding up, speeding up. Eventually, they wind all the way out until they get to the kind of output of it, and you have this beam that comes out. One of the big reasons to accelerate particles is to eventually collide with something. Sometimes that might be stationary something, like blocks of lead or you know, some other kind of target. Sometimes that's other particles that you've accelerated. And that turns out to be one of the more popular ways or quite useful ways of doing this because when you smash sort of two beams of particles that you've accelerated, the overall energy is sort of the sum of the two of them flying. So if you only smash particles into a stationary thing, then that's just the energy of this moving thing, right? So if you smash two beams of accelerated particles together, you've got double your, uh, double your money there. So this uh, diagram shown here is of the Cornell electron storage room, and it starts out with a linear accelerator that accelerates electrons and positrons, not at the same time, I think, but one after another. And so you accelerate, say, the electrons, and you put them into this large circular ring. You get the positrons coming out, and you actually end up shooting them around the opposite direction. But they're not going to collide right away. You can kind of keep them separate, or you can keep them in two different rings, or do whatever you want. But you keep them going around, and you're finally ready to collide them. That's when you sort of focus those beams down, using magnetic fields usually, and you smash them together right inside of a detector or a series of detectors. In this case, the main one looks like Clio. There's also these chest detectors. So that would be the point where you would smash these particle beams together. Um, to give you an idea of the size, there's a picture here. Uh, looks like a football pitch or something in there. But the white circle, that's this accelerator. That's this, this outer storage ring here, right? So quite large. And so part of the game in doing this is just to get to higher energies. The higher the energy that you can get these particles up to, the faster they're going, the more energy they have. If you get to high enough energy levels, you can possibly even start creating particles that have a very large mass, but they don't exist for very long. So it looks like these got their electrons and positrons each accelerated up to about four and a half to six giga electron volts. Pretty impressive. The LHC's got them beat by a few orders of magnitude now, though. I'm not sure when this collider was built, but I feel like it was a while ago at this point. So when you do bring those particle beams together, those particles that you've accelerated in one way or another, eventually you collide them together, kind of just to see what happens. When you do that, you want to have a lot of information about what happens. Right? The way you do that is generally by building around the collision point these detectors that are made up of multiple stages of instruments. The text goes into more detail into what's actually going on in the image there. I don't know if it's really worth it to talk too much about it, but I guess we'll just say at least that all those different pieces that make up one detector in this collider do different things, but mostly having to do with tracking the path of a particle and measuring the amount of energy that it has. This is what's known as the compact muon solenoid. Not very compact. I don't know. Somebody had a fun name in this one. But uh, more commonly known as CMS. And if you look in the bottom left of the diagram, there is an image for scale. And this diagram is sort of looking like down along the beam line, the path the particles would take is going straight into that picture. And the section is just cut out like a almost like a piece of pie cut out of the CMS detector there. Pretty impressive things in themselves, and they're only part of this even larger experiment. The picture down here is a picture of the actual CMS detector. It's like certainly something out of science fiction. Very cool stuff. That pipe down the middle, that's where the beam of particles would go, right? Or at least one of them, where they go from opposite direction to collide. Generally, actually, you have like clumps of particles in these colliders. And so like a beam is made up of like a clump here, a clump here, a clump here. They're all traveling along. And the opposite beam will come in the opposite direction, also made up of clumps. And those clumps will overlap, and that's where all the collisions will happen. So you get these kind of multiple stages of events. Wild stuff. Didn't want to leave out other kinds of particle detectors. I don't know if the book really even mentions things beyond 
particle accelerators and colliders, but there are plenty of ways to do particle physics without needing those things, without needing accelerators and colliders. Mainly to do with what you might call passive detectors, where you're mostly building something that's going to detect stuff that just is naturally around. So some examples are like Super Kamiokande or Super K that is basically a giant vat of super pure water with really specialized kind of cameras almost in a way looking in at this water. In that picture you can see the two little guys on the raft inside of the detector. Right now it's not filled up with water, I think they're cleaning the faces of these cameras. The cameras with kind of like cameras. But the whole thing would be filled up the super pure water during a detection period. So that is meant to detect neutrinos. Some of these other things here are also meant to detect neutrinos. One is Ice Cube. Ice Cube is an experiment at the South Pole, and it's maybe not so easy to see in this picture, but the very top image that's pulled out is sort of the man station part of Ice Cube, where the detector itself is actually under the ice. They've actually sunk in these sort of strings of detectors down into the ice. And the portion where you'd actually man the instruments and all that is on the top. And that thing itself is like, you know, a fairly decent sized two-story building. So that thing is pretty tiny even compared to the size of the full detector. The bottom left there is actually a neutrino detector that I worked on in graduate school called the Mini Time Cube. Partly I just wanted to give that one just because you might get the impression that you need massive things in order to do particle physics. It's not always the case. That cube was certainly a prototype, cutting edge sort of thing, but you know, it was only about that big. The cube itself, the full detector, you know, maybe the size of a fridge or two altogether. The last one on here is a picture of the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, or AMS, and that is on the International Space Station. This picture you see the astronaut floating around doing something or other. And AMS is that like kind of uh, cylindrical object in a way, right in the middle of the picture. Um, you can look it up and you can see other images of it on the ISS. And that's just looking at the radiation that's coming from all over, kind of down towards the Earth, and has all kinds of detectors in there to see what's going on with that radiation. So other kinds of particle detectors. When you get into dealing with particle physics on a mathematical level, it gets complicated. If you're dealing with quantum mechanics and relativity, sort of roll into one. But luckily, this physicist came up with a really clever way of sort of talking about and writing down particle interactions that allows you to sort of encode a lot of mathematical information into very simple pictures. Right? And then you can sort of think about the pictures and not have to worry as much about these complex equations going on behind them. Eventually you do have to deal with complex equations if you want to calculate probabilities and such. But you just sort of think about the processes, it's a lot easier to deal with diagrams than it is with these mathematical formulas because they're very complicated. That physicist was Richard Feynman, and so we call these diagrams Feynman diagrams. And they look like this. Lines and squiggles and dotted lines, uh, loopy lines. So in these diagrams, pretty much all the straight lines are either leptons or quarks. The other lines, which are usually some kind of squiggle or dash or something, are the bosons. The axes in these pictures are time and sometimes written in space. It's sort of confusing to me as to why you might even want to write the space direction. I think it more helps to think about things getting closer and farther together, but I don't know. Anyway, at least in these diagrams, time is evolving. It's not really standardized which direction you put time, but the most common ones you see are time going from the bottom to the top, or time going from the left to the right. So it helps to kind of see something of like a video or a moving image of it, like this GIF, where this diagram is representing two electrons, and they're sort of approaching each other as time evolves, right? Time's going to the right here. At some point, they exchange a photon. That's the squiggly line, it's a photon. And then they repel. So this is a picture of two electrons interacting via the exchange of a photon, technically a virtual photon. So it's a picture of an electromagnetic interaction. On the left there is a picture of an electron and an electron neutrino 
interacting, we're scattering off each other. You could also say these are like electrons that kind of come in and scatter off each other. But there you have the electron and the electron neutrino coming in, they actually end up exchanging this Z0 boson and moving away. So that's an interaction via that Z0 boson. This is a weak interaction being shown there. And it can get very confusing, real and virtual stuff. The simplest way to think about virtual particles is in a Feynman diagram, those are the particles that don't exit the diagram. So on the picture there, the electron and the neutrino are both coming from outside, sort of doing this exchange and then leaving. So those things are both entering and exiting. They're real. The Z0 there does not exist outside of that diagram. That's a virtual particle. Same thing here with the photon. The photon doesn't get outside of this diagram. It's a virtual photon. The terminology can get very confusing at this point. So don't worry too much about what it actually means to be real and virtual right now. But if you're looking at a Feynman diagram, it's pretty easy to tell just the ones that are inside the diagram. So you might be looking at these diagrams thinking, well, there's some lines, right? Not a lot there. But like I mentioned, they do encode quite a bit of mathematical information. So I'll give you a little taste of that for an idea of the gory details here. So if you ignore a lot of the other symbols for now and just look at the lines, this looks like time is evolving from the left to the right. And we have an electron on the bottom and a positron up on the top here. And they're eventually coming together and that looks like an annihilation process where you create a photon. That photon evolves for a little bit and then spontaneously creates a muon and an anti-muon pair, right? And those move off. So this looks like an annihilation and then this sort of creation event. Each of the pieces in a Feynman diagram has a meaning and that has to do with like the space-time sort of version of momentum for each of these particles that's associated with any of the lines here. The vertex, right, where any of these three lines meet up, those have to do with a vertex factor. They have a vertex factor associated with them. The virtual one or the uh, force carrier between has this mathematical factor called the propagator. So you put all those things together in a way, you end up getting something that tells you about the probability of this interaction happening. That thing is generally called a scattering amplitude. So you get M by sort of combining all of these things. And this is still even kind of a simplified way of writing it because many of these things are vectors. G mu nu is actually a matrix. A lot of stuff going on in there. But Feynman diagrams make it all very nice to at least conceptualize and think about these processes. One process we've talked about a good bit is beta decay. Right? We talked about it a good bit last chapter at least, and that is when a neutron spontaneously decays into a proton and an electron and an antineutrino, technically an anti-electron neutrino. So we can represent that with Feynman diagrams. At one level, you just represent the neutron and the proton as lines, single lines, and what actually happens from sort of the particle physics perspective is that the neutron sort of comes up, time is evolving upwards here. The neutron sort of comes up and decays into a proton and a W minus boson. So this is a weak interaction. That W minus doesn't go very far. It's a virtual particle here because it almost immediately goes and decays into that electron and the anti-electron neutrino. That's sort of one level of looking at it. We can get a little bit deeper by remembering that the neutron and the proton are made up of quarks. And so at even a more fundamental level, the neutron is this combination of up, down, down quarks. And what's happening is that that down quark, or one of the down quarks, is turning into an up quark and emitting this W minus boson. And again, that W minus pretty quickly then decays into that electron and the anti-electron neutron. And like I said, I was doing some paintings of these things, kind of interpreting them in different ways with colors and such. And you know, that's my interpretation of beta decay. As I mentioned before, the force carriers of the strong force, the gluons, are actually charged under the strong force. So in our picture, that means they also carry color, like the quarks do. And it turns out that each gluon carries two colors. It has to carry a color and an anti-color. And so we can draw Feynman diagrams for the strong interactions too. That's kind of odd picture maybe, you generally when you draw the gluons, they're that squiggly sort of line. 
So this is a kind of a Feynman diagram for a strong interaction we might call color exchange. So each of these straight lines that come in and leave the diagram, those are quarks. It doesn't really matter what kind of quarks they are, but for sure their colors are indicated on there. So the left one is red, the right one coming in is green, and the strong interaction can be drawn as a Feynman diagram where those red and green quarks come together, the red sort of emits this gluon that carries away the red color. But remember, gluon has color and anti-color, but it carries away the red and also has anti-green. And so when it meets the green quark on the other side, that green and anti-green sort of cancel each other out, and you end up with a red quark coming out this side. And since this initial red quark gave off that red and anti-green, in order to balance out the anti-green, it goes away as a green quark. So if you ever are drawing Feynman diagrams for the strong force, something that needs to happen is that every vertex in the Feynman diagram, the color needs to be conserved. So like on the left, red went in, red came out. Anti-green came out, and green came out, right? So together, those are good. Green and anti-green is nothing, or neutral. On the right one, green comes in, and anti-green comes in. Right? So you get neutral. Red also comes in, and red goes out. Good. Part of what makes the strong force such a complicated thing is the fact that the gluons, the force carriers of the strong force, are charged. It would be like a, a photon having an electrical charge. That would complicate electromagnetism to no end. And jump back really quick. I showed you this earlier. It's sort of a combination of fine diagrams in a way but at each of these vertex, or vertices, the color is conserved. So whatever colors come in, they either need to cancel each other out or they need to go out the other side. And each of the gluons, the squiggly lines, carry two colors. All right, so one more picture of interactions before we sort of move on to cosmology. What is it that's actually holding protons and neutrons together? Well, we now know that protons and neutrons are each made up of quarks three quarks each. And I told you before that it's in fact the strong force that is binding the protons and the neutrons together. That comes about via the exchange of quarks. So in the diagram on the left, it's a kind of a fine diagram, there's more embellishment going on, but we have a proton and a neutron, right? They're sort of coming together and in between some stuff happens, but the overall picture is that you actually transfer a pi plus, which is an up and an anti-down quark, from the proton to the neutron. And in the process of doing that, the proton has become a neutron, the neutron absorbs those quarks, and becomes a proton. You can't really get into the details, but this is a picture of how a nucleus is held together. It's an exchange of ions. And in that exchange, protons become neutrons, neutrons become protons, we go back and forth. So this then is my sort of artistic interpretation of that process, at least sort of the middle part of that process. There's other kind of exchange of gluons that are shown in that diagram that are not in the image here on the right. But in that painting, you have the proton on the left, it's made up of the three quarks, and some stuff happens, but basically it emits these two lines together, which make up the pi plus, the pi on. And in doing so, it's transformed into a neutron, kind of moves off. On the opposite side here, we have a neutron, there's three lines, there's three quarks. They come up together, and they sort of absorb that pi on, and in the process, transform into a proton. Right? And those three quarks then move off. You can definitely say more about these images too, but you know, this is physics course, so maybe we just say that the colors all there are representative of the quarks and the gluons colors as well. That's about all we're going to say about particle physics. But how do we get from particle physics to cosmology? It's sort of the smallest stuff that we can think of to the largest scales of things, the largest things we can think of. One way we get there is by thinking about these forces and the fact that it appears that at higher and higher energy levels, or higher and higher amounts of energy, these forces, these four different forces, seem like they might want to start to combine. And in fact, it's already been found and shown that the electromagnetic force and the weak force 
at high enough energies combine and become the same force. All the stuff that interacts via electromagnetism and the weak force end up acting the same way or following the exact same rules in a sense. So that unification of electromagnetism and the weak force, we end up terming that as the electroweak force. That unification ends up happening at about 100 giga electron volts. And it wasn't until fairly recently that we could achieve those energies, but at this point, we achieve energies like 10 times that, even 100 times that. And so it's thought that if you were to go to higher and higher energies, the strengths of these forces end up sort of coming together to be at the same level, and you eventually combine. And if you were to combine that electroweak force and the strong force, we think those combine at a certain energy scale. That's what we call a grand unified theory. You have a theory that describes the combination or the unification of the strong, the electromagnetic, and the weak forces. That's your grand unified theory. We're good. At even higher energies, it's thought that gravity then combines with all the other forces too, and we get what's called the theory of everything. The theory that combines all the fundamental forces we know of is that to great names. Great names. Yeah. And the reason that this gets us to thinking about cosmology in the universe is the way that we understand the beginning of the universe is that everything was sort of smashed together, and that means there's a situation where energies are almost unimaginably high, almost infinitely high. So in the very beginning of the universe, our current sort of best thinking is that all these forces were combined. And it's only as the universe sort of expanded and things cooled down, the energy dropped, that all these forces start to decouple and separate, become different kinds of forces. So why do we think the universe actually was crushed down altogether at some point in the distant past? Well, that has to do with something that this guy Hubble noticed a while ago, like the 1920s or so. And that's what we'll get to next. This guy Hubble was doing a survey of galaxies. I think it had even recently turned out that he realized there was more galaxies than our own. But anyway, he was surveying these galaxies and measuring their velocities relative to the Earth. The details of how you do that, you can understand already at least a good bit about how you might do that by thinking about the red shifts of emission lines. So there's a bunch of hydrogen in pretty much any galaxy, and hydrogen has specific emission lines and these sets of emission lines that we learned all about. If you look at those emission lines and you see how much they've been red shifted or blue shifted, that tells you the velocity of this object moving away from you or moving toward you. So you can get a measure of their red shift, which tells you about their speed. And so he did that in a bunch of galaxies, and this is what the plot he ended up getting looked like. It's quite surprising that all of these galaxies, except for ones that are in our galactic neighborhood, they're all moving away from us. And the further away you look, the faster they're moving away from us. I actually draw a fit to this distance velocity graph, and all you get out of this is h0, the slope of this graph, and that's what we call Hubble's constant. And so the conclusion we kind of come to from this is that if you look further and further away, things are moving faster and faster away from you. That makes sense if the universe is expanding, meaning that space-time itself is expanding. The space in between galaxies is getting larger over time. And so this constant, Hubble's constant, kind of gives you a, a measure, at least, of the rate of that expansion. It's interesting to kind of put yourself in the mindset, maybe for a minute, of Hubble doing this survey, and if you look at all the velocities of galaxies all over the universe, there's no reason to think that they would have any sort of correlation, right? Some would be coming towards us, some would be going away from us, just kind of random. Big surprise, not random. You get this linear plot. You've probably seen this sort of image before, or demonstration before, of trying to understand what it means for space-time to be expanding. This is one of the better visuals, I think, at least. So you take this balloon on the left, the surface of that balloon is space-time in this analogy. The space-time all kind of collapsed down to this two-dimensional surface. Take that balloon then and start filling it up with air. It's going to expand, stretching, it's expanding, and think about the distance between any of these dots now. All the distances have grown. And beyond that, if you think about a reference frame or like being in the position of one of those dots, to that dot, every other dot looks like it's moving away from it. 
So if I'm standing at one of those dots and I'm looking around me, I'm looking at all the rest of the balloon, every part of the balloon is moving away from me. So that's space-time expanding. It's not that these things are just moving away from each other, it's that the space in between these galaxies is getting larger. Space-time in between. And it seems that this process really only takes over at very large scales. So on our scale, the space-time is not really expanding you know, between our atoms. And even within our galaxy and within the sort of neighboring galaxies, our galactic cluster, we're not getting to the large enough scales where this thing sort of happens. We'll talk very briefly about ideas of what is causing that, I think, right in the end. So we've pretty officially transitioned over into thinking about cosmology now, right? the big scale picture of the universe. And one of the first things physicists thought to do is say, how evenly distributed is stuff in the universe? Right? Are there really tight clumps of stuff over in this part of the universe and not much over here? So you do this survey, and this image is what the automated plate measurement galaxy survey. Over two million galaxies in this picture, and this is a region, it's not the entire sky, it's a region 100 degrees across, centered around the Milky Way's south pole. So it's sort of like you're looking out in a particular direction, and everything in that sphere, or in that part of the sphere, is included in this survey, and then what you do generally to look at these things is you project them onto this 2D space. So this is kind of like that portion of the sky flattened out. And from this picture, I mean, you can see some little bit of, maybe it looks like clumps here and there, but the size of those things going on there really isn't affecting the overall distribution of matter. Like you can kind of do a average of like where all the matter is on this sort of picture, and it's very even overall. What surveys like this tell us, and we'll look at a different one too, is that the universe is basically homogeneous and that it's fairly similar all over, like that it's not really unevenly distributed in terms of its matter and energy, and also that it seems to be isotropic, meaning directionally it seems the same in any sort of direction. There's no preferential direction you could turn in the universe. These are just some things that go into our understanding of cosmology, but the overall picture we get is that our universe is expanding and it looks very smooth overall. So if we sort of trace back or turn the clock back and trace back the expansion of the universe so that it's now contracting, we eventually get to a point where everything is basically all clumped together at once and it's unbelievably dense, like infinitely dense and unbelievably energetic and outrageous temperatures. But the fact that it's all very smooth now tells us something about how it actually expanded, like what happened in those early periods. And so we kind of are able to assess some things about how that process went because this is the kind of universe we have now. I mentioned already, I believe earlier in this lecture, the unification of the electromagnetic and the weak forces. This idea from particle physics that all of them essentially are going to combine probably at a very high energy scale also sort of points back to the very beginning of the universe because at that point it's almost infinitely high energy. So all of these forces were essentially one thing. And so when the universe just began, it was all together. And then you have this evolution from the very beginning. There's things happen at incredibly short time scales and these forces start to decouple, which leads to the formation of different things. Um, we'll see a picture of that more next slide too, but it's the splitting up of these forces it ends up allowing for these different things to form. In this picture, we have a couple different scales, the time evolution, so the earliest sort of time that physicists are gonna talk about is, looks like around 10 to the minus 43 seconds. That would be after the beginning of the universe. At that time, we're talking about energies that are 10 to the 19th giga electron volts. So that's 10 to the 25th electron volts, which is equivalent to temperatures of 10 to the 32nd Kelvin. Unimaginably high energies and temperatures. Between that and then about 10 to the minus 35th seconds, we get gravity splitting off from the other forces. And so it becomes a bit different. And this has to do with the energy overall dropping down, the temperature dropping down, and we continue along. Next, the strong force decouples, and then finally the electromagnetic and the weak force decouple. We eventually end up where we are today, 
the universe's temperature is about 3 Kelvin, or 10 to the minus 4 electron volts, and we're something like 10 to the 17th seconds after the Big Bang. This is a picture you may have seen something like it before. It's a pretty wild thing to think of, that this is, at least in a way, a picture of the entire universe from the beginning of time, the start of the universe to now. This covers at least some aspects, particularly cosmological aspects, of the entire universe. As I said, these forces are decoupling or splitting apart from each other as we get further along in time, as the energy drops down, as the temperature decreases, and the universe, the early universe, goes through these different ages until we finally come to the sort of age of the universe where we are now. You say the modern universe here, or the age of stars and galaxies. But where do we start? I think that the Big Bang is not really a great name, but it has stuck so far. It seems that unless our understanding changes a good bit, or somebody comes up with a better name, kind of stuck with that one. The idea here then, and it's something that I don't really quite understand super well either, but before our universe, there just wasn't this space and time that we're in now. But we still have theories about higher dimensional sort of planes of existence in a way, and in those higher dimensional spheres, there are still quantum fluctuations that happen. And basically, one of those fluctuations happened in just the right way in the start of our universe, right? That's the very beginning. Between there and 10 to the minus 32 seconds, it's an incredibly short period of time, we have this period of what's known as inflation. The universe starts out and then inflates, is kind of the word, or just expands at an unimaginable rate. And then past that time, we start to get the different forces decoupling, and you go through these different ages of the universe, you could call them, where like the age of leptons is basically that none of the forces besides gravity have decoupled, I think, at that point. And so everything's just like a soup of leptons, but eventually around a microsecond after the beginning of the universe, protons start to form and you get the age of nucleons. Then about 10 milliseconds or 0 0.0 seconds after the beginning of the universe, we start to get nuclear fusion beginning and you get the age of nuclear synthesis where nuclei are actually forming. Then about three minutes after the universe cools down enough and we stop the nuclear fusion, we have this age of ions where it's basically a bunch of nuclei but there's no uh, electrons that are attached to them. All the electrons are still ionized. So it's still this crazy charged plasma gas in a way. And finally, once the universe cools down enough, the electrons can start to attach to all those ions and you form atoms. And at that point, about 380,000 years after the beginning of the universe is when we get this sort of clearing of the universe in a way. Right? Because before this, when it's still ions and nuclei, nucleons and leptons, there are photons that are there but they're constantly being bounced around. Like they don't travel really in straight lines. They immediately are running into things and being bounced off of them. So there's no photons that are able to just kind of like fly out in straight lines and eventually get seen by some other place, right? They're constantly bouncing around. Then at about this 380,000 years after the beginning of the universe, we now have atoms and photons can finally just travel in straight lines. And that's where we get this cosmic microwave background. So sometimes that's called the last scattering event in the early universe, where the photons are no longer scattering off all these ions and such. They're actually traveling in straight lines, and we still eventually see some of them from the beginning of the universe. Well, 400,000 years after the beginning of the universe. But the universe is almost 14 billion years old. That's pretty close to the beginning. One way to think about this sort of last scattering event is thinking about light trying to come through a cloud. So whenever you look at a cloud, you're generally just seeing the bottom of the cloud. Right? If light was trying to come through, it just gets bounced around. There's no place inside the cloud where light will scatter off of and then come straight to you because you'd then be seeing the inside of the cloud. The only light that you actually see directly when it comes to you in that direct line is from the bottom of the cloud. So it's only after the photons are leaving the bottom of the cloud that you actually get to see it. Right? Above that, photons are just scattering around everywhere. You don't see the inside of the cloud behind that 380,000 years, that's still inside the cloud in a sense. It's only after we get to the bottom that we get a picture at least of that point. 
So then you have the atoms. Eventually those atoms start to cluster together, form galaxies and stars. Yeah, we get to our sort of modern universe where we now have stars and galaxies. It's a very brief overview. And here you go. This is one picture of the cosmic microwave background, that last scattering of photons from the very early universe. This one is from the WMAP, so the spacecraft, space observatory. Essentially kind of the edge of the visible universe we can see, which means that it's the furthest back in time of the universe that we actually see too. And just to point out that this sort of picture is the entire celestial sphere, like all the sky you're looking outwards. And it's sort of like taking a map of the Earth, or taking the globe, and pulling it off and putting it onto this 2D sort of oval like this. But here we're going sort of from the inside out, so we're taking the inside of this globe and opening it up and projecting it all into this oval. Won't say too much about this, but it is a nice wrap around where we talked about black body radiation a while ago, having to do with uh, temperature and the uh, peak wavelength, the peak emission wavelength in a black body spectrum. At our level, I think the only thing to really take away from this is that the models of how we think the universe started, that inflationary period, gives us a black body spectrum or predicts a black body spectrum. Those are the dots on this diagram. And if you just plot the black body curve that we know, I think I showed you it um, back when we were first talking about photons and matter waves. But if you just plot the black body curve with this temperature, it aligns with the data. There's error bars actually there, but they're so small that you don't even see them. They're not fathomable lines. This is just to say that our modeling of that early universe fits very well with the data that we collect. The last couple of things to tell you about is the different things we call dark. So for one, when we look out in the universe, we see some strange looking things. Right? This is a picture of a strange looking thing in the universe. There's a star there, and it looks like something's just wrapping around it. It turns out that general relativity predicts just this kind of thing. And that is that mass warps space, not just space, space time. So if you're on Earth, you're trying to look at a star, but there's a galaxy in the way, then the light from the star actually bends around the galaxy. And so you can get these kind of pictures. Um, this is a process called gravitational lensing. And there's a GIF actually up here showing the process where that sort of bluish or aqua circle is like a star that's moving across our vision. And if there was no matter there, then the bluish circle, that aqua circle, is what we would see. It just kind of keeps moving across. As it turns out, what we do see is that the image from that star starts to get like stretched as it comes to the side, and then eventually it gets pulled all the way around to this ring, we call it Einstein ring, and then squeezes back down and keeps moving on. Eventually it starts to line up again, or wood without any matter there. So this is one of the pieces of evidence that we have for something called dark matter. Essentially matter that we don't know what it is really. We have some things, we have ideas about it, but the basic thing we know is that it has mass, it warps space-time with that mass gravitationally, it warps space-time. We don't see it, and it doesn't really seem to interact any other way but gravitationally. Because if you look at this picture, the star in there and all the mass that we see in that space isn't enough to explain this warp. That's kind of what it comes down to. There are other pieces of evidence, like from the rotational curves of galaxies. Um, we just don't really have enough time to talk about some of those. But there you go. Dark matter is massive things that interact gravitationally. We just can't see them. The other dark thing is what we call dark energy. And that goes back to this expansion of the universe. And so Hubble saw that the universe was expanding. Uh, the further away you looked, the faster galaxies were moving away from you. Once we started to get better measurements of those speeds, it turns out that the universe isn't just expanding, it's accelerating in its expansion. It's getting bigger faster, right, as time goes on. And that's confusing because if it's just the matter that makes up the universe that we kind of see, then its gravitational interaction or attraction to all the other matter would seem to say that that expansion should be probably even slowing down and then eventually pulling all the matter back together, right? Gravity always attracts masses. That's just not the case. It's expanding. It's expanding faster and faster. So what is causing that expansion? We don't know. That's what we call dark energy. It seems to be something that is exerting an outward pressure on space-time in very large scales. Just to show you something from general relativity, 
this is one of Einstein's sort of famous equations. There's different ways of writing this equation, but if you look at this equation, the capital R with the subscripts and the other R and the G with the subscripts, those all are things having to do with the curvature, sort of the shape of space-time. On the other side, there's a bunch of constants. Big G is constant, C is speed of light. Capital T with the subscripts is something that tells you about the matter and the energy density in space-time. The last thing in there, then, is capital lambda. Turns out that thing, depending on the sign of it and how large it is, will result in an expanding or a contracting or a static universe. So Einstein put that in there. He thought the universe was static, so he made a particular value. Turns out that it's actually something different, and it seems to be somewhat taken into account of general relativity that if this thing is a certain value, it manages to model well or line up well with the expansion of the universe. So that capital lambda is often called the cosmological constant, and it is associated with dark energy. But what dark energy actually is, good luck. In the big picture of the universe, this is sort of where we're at, what I call the known unknowns. You take all the matter energy content of the universe and put it on a pie chart. Regular matter, atoms, baryons, hadrons, leptons, all that stuff, is in that roughly 5%. That's that little sliver. Dark energy makes up more than two-thirds of the matter energy content of the universe, as far as we can tell. Dark matter makes up about a quarter, as far as we can tell. So of the stuff that we know we don't know about, almost 95% of the universe. It doesn't really say much about anything about the stuff we don't know we don't know about. We do know quite a lot about the atoms, though. So that fact about what it is we know we know about what we know we don't know about what we don't know that we don't know about, you can take it different ways. I find it quite exciting. The textbook actually ends with a quote from Newton. It's not quite the quote I would have chosen, I guess, because it implies a sort of separation between us the observers, the curious beings, trying to figure things out, and the rest of the universe. Something that modern physics has come to kind of again and again is that everything's sort of connected. Right? The way we describe particle physics with these fundamental entities and forces, on this level you don't necessarily see that as much, but what it turns out to be is that those particles are really just oscillations in the fields that permeate the universe. It just seems to be that we can't really understand things purely in isolation. So I came up with another quote, one that I enjoy you might have heard before. It says, some people can read War and Peace and come away thinking that it's a simple adventure story. Others can read the ingredients on a chewing gum wrapper and unlock the secrets of the universe. And the stuff I've just told you about how we go from understanding the smallest thing in the universe to understanding the universe at large, and it goes along with that. And wrapped in there is sort of the importance of your own perspective. All right, well, it's been quite a semester. I hope you've enjoyed this. And at the very least, hopefully you understand a little bit more about what physics has to say about the universe.